Hi, thank you very much. And as she said, I've newly moved to Las Vegas to join the surgery department at UNLV School of Medicine. Thank you very much to the chairs and to SAGES for the opportunity to present on endoscopic management of ulcer disease perforations. I have nothing to disclose. Peptic ulcer disease has many etiologies, including most frequently H. pylori infection and prolonged NSAID use. The incidence of perforated peptic ulcer disease has decreased with treatment for H. pylori infection, but it still occurs. In general, perforations are more often duodenal than gastric, and historically, treatment, treatment has been to operate for abdominal washout and closing or patching of the perforation, followed by H. pylori eradication and cessation of other aggravating factors like NSAIDs. However, this algorithm still leaves room for improvement. A nationwide Danish study of all patients who had surgery for perforated peptic ulcer diseases between uh, 2011 and 2013 showed a whopping 17% required reoperation within the first 30 days postoperatively, and there was a 90-day mortality rate of 26%. Another common cause of perforated ulcers is marginal ulcer disease. There are com these are common late complications of gastric bypass surgery. In these cases, this, these ulcerations are at the gastrojejunal anastomosis, most often on the jejunal side, and these occur in about 4 to 7% of cases. While marginal ulcer disease is asymptomatic in many patients, perforations tend to happen in patients with identifiable risk factors. A large cohort study looked at over 3,400 laparoscopic uh, gastric bypass patients. In this cohort, 35, or 1% of patients, developed perforated marginal ulcers. Of these, only 20% or 0.2% of all bypass patients had no risk factors or warning signs, while 80% had one of these listed factors. Yep, one of those listed factors. Um, Preoperative H. pylori infection is also a risk factor for marginal ulcer development, even with no H. pylori present in biopsies from the gastric pouch. So what role does endoscopic therapy play in improving our approach to perforated ulcers? When well, we first need to discuss the elephant in the room, as Tara also pointed out, Sometimes these patients need surgery first, by which I mean intraperitoneal surgery. I think we instinctively know who these are, but if a patient presents with peritonitis, diffuse pneumoperitoneum, and certainly signs of shock, they, and they are a reasonable surgical candidate, they should have an operation. In general, for the OR, I recommend you plan to do what you do best, whether that be a laparoscopic, robotic-assisted, or open approach. Have an endoscope in the room, preferably with both irrigation and CO2 insufflation. It can aid in localizing the perforation and in leak testing or otherwise assessing your repair. Also, always plan to establish distal feeding access as part of this case. The endoscope can be used for this as well. Finally, I still leave a drain. I know that's a debated subject, but I'd rather uh, have it and remove it than need it and wish I'd put it in. A lot of endoscopic options for perforated ulcer treatment come into play when an initial operative repair fails. That's not always the case, as I'll show you, but I think it's safe to say that many surgeons are still pretty uncomfortable with the idea of endoscopic therapy as the primary treatment for perforated ulcer disease. With endoscopic approaches, the first tenet is to make sure any intraperitoneal cavity is drained. This could be a previously placed operative drain, a percutaneously placed drain, or endoluminal vacuum drainage. When dealing with small defects, you can use endoluminal vacuum drainage or over-the-scope clips, as have already been demonstrated. And for larger defects, endoluminal suturing works well to close the edges. I'll talk about endoluminal vacuum therapy first. This was first used to treat intrathoracic anastomotic leaks. While there are no studies that I'm aware of for evac use and perforated ulcer disease, it has been expanded in clinical use, and we've heard a lot about it today. It makes sense to me to use it in perforated ulcer disease, especially with focal or contained extraluminal drainage. Uh, sorry, leakage, because it does provide extraluminal drainage. Additionally, it increases blood flow to the area of injured tissue, promoting healing, and it provides frequent debridement of the tissue. It unfortunately involves frequent sedated changes and creates the discomfort of an NG tube. These images have been shown already, but they're some of the steps for the extracorporeal um, setup, courtesy of Dr. Leeds' paper. The following is a video that's being presented in its entirety by Dr. Alexander Liu, who's in Dr. Eric Pauly's lab at Penn State. They granted me permission to use it to show the technique. This patient had a history of ruin Y gastric bypass and presented to the hospital with an anterior GJ perforated marginal ulcer. She had an initial laparotomy with washout, modified gram patch, and drainage. On post-up day four, a CT showed a contained leak from the GJ. So the area is explored endoscopically with a GIF H190 scope. You can see some material here from the um, original closure. The scope cap used helps create visualization space against tissue, and it can help debris tissue if necessary as well. So investigating the area, here's the anastomosis. 
Upon withdrawing from the RU limb, you can see a breakdown of a primary repair right there at the GJ anastomosis. This defect is a little bit smaller than the cap, so it's about eight to nine millimeters. So evac therapy or over the scope therapy could be considered. You always want to suction as much debris from the area as possible and um, try to traverse the defect, even if you have to downsize your scope. This is an N180 scope here. So once across the defect, irrigate, suction, debris as much as possible. Uh, the drains placed at surgery aren't present in this cavity, so evac is a much better choice here because that area would otherwise not be drained. Cut the sponge to fit the defect, then using biopsy forceps um, through a 2 perlian suture loop at the end of that sponge, bring it down the esophagus and place it across the defect. You might, uh, sorry, you want most of the sponge to be extra luminal as we've talked about with just the cuff at the defect opening. Applying suction to the NG tube through the negative pressure machine you plan to use prior to withdrawing the scope can allow it to be anchored in place better. The next option for a small defect closure are clips. The over-the-scope clip system, or OTSC, was designed by Ovesco and was first used as a last endoscopic resort for treatment of GI bleeding and iatrogenic perforation. This technique provides definitive closure of a lesion, and the clips have good purchase in the tissue even when inflamed or indurated. The biggest drawback in this technique is that they are quite difficult to remove if they are misfired or need to be removed down the line. There have been some case studies with over-the-scope clip closure as primary therapy. However, recently, to evaluate urgent primary endoscopic therapy for perforated ulcers, a Chinese group conducted a retrospective review of a single-center university hospital. They included all patients over a two-year period who presented with perforated ulcers. 120 patients were identified, and 14 were the, of these were excluded due to needing emergency operations at presentation. 106 patients were included in the study, 26 treated with endoscopy and over-the-scope clips, and 80 with pharmacotherapy as the initial choice, and they deemed this the control group. The two groups were demographically similar. The perforations were relatively similar in location as well, although 56 or 70% in the control group were unlocalized. In patients treated with clips, the mean size of the perforation was five millimeters, so relatively small. Clinical success, meaning improved abdominal pain and persistent CT-verified closure of the perforation was achieved in all of the CLIP patients and in 58% of the control group. Their hospital stays and antibiotic usage were similar, but the CLIP group was significantly um, faster to resume to oral feeding. Additionally, none of the CLIP group patients required subsequent intra-abdominal therapy within the first 30 days post-procedure, uh, post while 30% of the control group required surgery for failure of treatment, and 14% died while in the hospital, mostly from sepsis. There were no mortalities in the CLIP group. So as a retrospective study, what can we draw from this? The first takeaway is that over-the-scope CLIPs may be safe as initial therapy for acute upper GI perforations from ulcer disease in certain patients. Um, in this study, they didn't attempt to close any lesions bigger than 15 millimeters because some, because some previous studies had shown that the clip has a hard time handling a bigger lesion in indurated or inflamed tissue. And finally, with over-the-scope ther clip therapy as a primary modality, patients may need to undergo drainage procedures in the future, though these patients did not require that within the short 30-day follow-up period. To show you a, a clip in use, this video was recorded by Dr. Joseph Winder at Penn State, and I was given permission to show it here for the technique. This patient presented with peritonitis and pneumoperitoneum on imaging. The patient was taken to the OR for a lap converted to open washout and gram patch of a D1 perforation. Postoperatively, the patient improved, but this improvement stalled, and a CT around post-op day 10 showed a duodenal leak. So the patient was taken to the OR for endoscopic evaluation. This is performed with a GIF1TH190 gastroscope. You can see a small defect in D1 in the area of the previous gram patch. Again, always try to advance across the defect, as this can allow for evaluation of the intraperitoneal cavity as well as suction and debridement. However, this defect is very small, and this was um, impossible here. With this very small defect and a surgical drain already in place, an over-the-scope clip is a great option. This is loaded on the scope with a cap, these clips come in different sizes and types. This is a 12-6 clip and a type T, which is the best for duodenal closure. There's also a GC, which has longer, more aggressive teeth and should only be used in the stomach. Um, and an A, which uh, doesn't have teeth and is used mostly for bleeding. You wanna keep the scope and the cap centered on the defect and ensure you're not significantly narrowing the lumen. So you can see this defect in the middle of this cap here. This is the uh, tissue anchor advancing through the center 
of the defect. This has three prongs on it that will then extend into the tissue and help um, get, give you purchase on the indurated tissue. Pull the tissue into the scope cap, ensuring that the end of the anchor is within the cap because otherwise you close the clip on the anchor. Um, once this is done, you apply suction and when you are, your instrument is stabilized and you're ready, you can deploy the clip. Um, as you've seen, there's another option for tissue grasping, which is the twin grasper from uh, Ovesco, which allows the double grasping on either side that can help bring bigger defects together. So the clip is now deployed. Withdraw the anchor. And once this is done, the tissue will release. And then go back and evaluate the area. So here we can see the um, closure with the clip to the left and a patent um, lumen to the right. After this is completed, an NJ tube is placed through the endoscope to provide distal feeding access. For large defects, larger than 15 millimeters, the best endoscopic option for closure is an endoluminal suturing device. And again, I'm speaking about defects from ulcer disease, so indurated inflamed tissue. The sizes are different when you're dealing with different etiologies. The current FDA-approved devices are made by Apollo and include the Overstitch, Overstitch SX, and the XTAC. These devices were designed to close intentional mucosal defects, but their use has been expanded in clinical practices. The benefit of this technique is the ability to close larger and irregular defects. It does have the drawback of requiring a larger lumen for introduction of the device, though with the SX, which is over a single lumen device, that's changed a little bit. There's again limited research involving endoluminal suturing excuse me, in ulcer perforations. A case series out of Johns Hopkins retrospectively evaluated patients with marginal ulcers at, uh, after Renoir gastric bypass. Out of 11 patients evaluated, two presented with acutely perforated ulcers and nine had recalcitrant ulcers after maximal medical therapy. The two patients with perforation underwent endoluminal suturing with resolution of their symptoms and no further interventions. This video is unfortunately the same patient as the EVAC video recorded by Dr. Liu and Dr. Pali. The patient unfortunately removed the NG tube with the EVAC dressing in PACU, so they returned to the OR the following day for definitive closure. Again, traverse the defect, and in this patient we're gonna look for more definitive closure because the EVAC didn't work with the irritation at the nose. So to get drainage, because there are no drains in the space, um, one option is a percutaneous pigtail drain placed with fluoroscopic and endoscopic guidance. With air in the abscess cavity, this is placed much the same way as a peg tube. Advance a fine needle while aspirating to ensure a clear track. You can check that with fluoroscopy. And then advance a 12 French cook drain into the cavity. So now that the cavity is drained, the defect can be closed. This could be approached with either an over-the-scope clip or endoluminous suturing, but as it's nearing the upper size limit or size comfort for the clip, the um, suturing is a great option for here. Using a dual channel 2TH180 scope with the Apollo overstitch device, close the defect in a running fashion. Uh, the overstitch system has a tissue helix that you've seen, but I love the use of biopsy forceps here, and I'm definitely going to do that in the future. It gives a better traction, and you don't have to stab the tissue with the helix. Um, as you've heard, these have both absorbable and non absorbable suture loads. So once the uh, once the defect is closed, uh, apply pressure on your suture to close everything down, and then a suture cinch device is uh, closed to close off the suture line. Withdraw the device, and then you can see a well-closed defect. Last but not least, a guide wire is fed down the alimentary limb, and an NJ tube is placed uh, over, with, um, over the wire with endoscopic guidance. So the points I hope you take away from this are Take patients to the OR who need surgery, first and foremost. Make sure any cavity is drained somehow, though the study with primary treatment with over-the-scope clips suggests this may not be necessary in, in the acute setting in all patients. Consider EVAC or over-the-scope clips for closure of small defects um, in either primary or post-operative treatment. Consider endoluminal suturing to close large defects. And finally, always place distal feeding access. These techniques can sometimes help the patient avoid another more invasive operation and may, as we become more comfortable, allow them to avoid an invasive operation altogether. These are my references. Thank you so much for your attention.